Welcome to the Viva Vegan Podcast with me, Faye, and me, Lex. On this episode, we meet Ray Starr. She's a multi-award winning young adult fantasy fiction author from Essex. Her breakthrough novel, Earthlings The Beginning, is the first instalment of the Earthlings trilogy, exploring family, friendship, the climate crisis, and the desire to do what's right against all odds. Prior to the launch of book two in the series, Dominion, I got to sit down with Ray and learn more about her vegan journey, the magical world of Peridot, and how she uses writing to advocate for environmental action and animal rights. Ray, thank you so much for joining us on the Viva Vegan podcast to talk all things magic. I'll just start by saying how much I loved reading the first book, Earthlings, and absolutely cannot wait to get stuck into the second one. So before we do get started, though, have you got a strong copper? I have a slight tea addiction. You can even tell in the books, can't you? Just someone yeah. in every stage has a cup of tea or is wanting a cup of tea. Tea makes the world go round. It does indeed. But before we get started talking about the books, let's just begin with you, because you're a Veganuary alumni from 2018. So tell us how you got there. What propelled you to sign up to that challenge and how did you find it? Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, thank you for all your lovely kind words and for having me. I cannot even believe I've been invited to be on this podcast. I'm still pinching myself. So thank you very, very much. Aww. I'm thrilled to be here. And um, my vegan journey, I guess, started like a lot of other people's and that it wasn't just one thing. There were so many different aspects that kind of propelled me forward into that. And I only wish I'd found it sooner. Um so the major kind of starting point for me, unfortunately, was that my dad died of um, pancreatic cancer in 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he was diagnosed, diagnosed, sorry, um, the first thing that the doctor said to him is, you know, for, they gave him three months to live, which I wasn't aware of at the time. But they said, you know, to make that three months, potentially 10, um, you know, you need to immediately cut out all red meat, dairy and eggs. Um, now, the term vegan wasn't used um, back then. I, I won't lie, I didn't even know what veganism was. I've never heard of it. My dad certainly had not And he was a typical uh, English pub grub kind of man, you know. So instead of having steak and chips every night, it then turned into chicken and chips every night, you know, and all those amazing yeah. foods that we now have as vegans, you know, your chickpea curries, your three bean wraps and, you know, your lentil hot pots and everything. We weren't aware of that kind of way of eating. So health-wise, um, he did make it the 10 months just from cutting out, you know, the red meat and the dairy. It did have, you know, a huge effect on him. Um, they gave him three months. So he lasted like nearly a year, uh, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. But we were very aware that was because of certain things that he cut out of his food um, choices. And it led me to think, well, if that's what's potentially making us ill in the first place, you know, huge alarm bells there, you know, what, what else is going on there? And I guess that was a kind of starting point for me. And I almost stumbled across the January. Um, yeah through social media, I believe. And then my life just changed forever. Just that 30 month pledge of all those resources and all that information, you know, you get the documentaries, you get the Dr. Gregor's uh, Daily Dozen prompt, which is um, health wise. (laughs) I I genuinely swear that is the reason that I managed to have children because I was having issues trying to conceive and all sorts. And then a couple of weeks of doing that, I now have two children. So just bang out of nowhere, I'd recommend it to anyone if you have children. Download Dr. Greg's Daily Dozen and do that app. It's amazing. But um, health-wise, life-wise, everything, it's just changed my entire world. And I'm so, so glad I found veganism. I wish I found it sooner. Yeah. Did you find it quite easy to stick to for the full 30 days? Yeah, I did, but only because of the documentaries. I think that's why I've taken the path that I've done um, is because that's what influenced me so, so much. I mean, the health aspects were originally where it stemmed from because of dad. But the reason that I've gone full vegan and I will be vegan for the rest of my life and I'm raising my children vegan is that I've seen the way that certain foods are made and what happens, you know, to those animals. You know, they're not food, they're animals, you know. And when you see yeah. what's done to them in such graphic detail, you just, your life changes forever, you know. So I actually had a year plan. I planned the first three months, cut out meat, then three months later, cut out um dairy three months after cut out eggs and the last three months cut out fish which is what I thought I would miss the most but as soon as I saw you know the documentaries the cowspiracy earthlings dominion land of hope and glory you know all all of them that was it you know I was just like wow never touched an animal product since so um well done to those documentary makers (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah. And you've worked in PR for pretty much your entire professional life. What was it that made you take this plunge into the world of fantasy fiction? And what was the process of switching your writing style to go from writing sort of press releases and articles to then <laughs> like a full novel, like trilogy, no less? It's not just one book yeah. in the series, there's going to be three. That's such a fantastic question. It really, really is because on the personal level, I pretty much went vegan, like I say, after Veganuary, it was easy. But then I realised in my work life, I wasn't vegan. You know, I had a PR agency. I had a photography studio for over 15 years. And it was a successful business. You know, it was making money, but it wasn't vegan. It wasn't unvegan, but a lot of my clients weren't vegan. You know, they come to me with certain brands and products that they'd want to promote and it was this real confliction conf for me, you know, do I take this PR campaign X amount of money because, yes, I've got a mortgage and, you know, all the stuff, I need the money, but it's promoting things that I don't agree with, you know, and how do I then relay that to my clients? And I was very, very aware that unless I changed my PR business into strictly a vegan PR business, I couldn't continue trading. And then lockdown happened and... I've been toying with the idea of this book for a while and I just thought, you know what, I can't work at the moment, so let's write it. And I did. And it was the best thing I ever did. And then as I was writing it, I believed in it. I don't know if you readers feel that as they're reading it. I hope that they do. But with every single word I put into that book, like it's got my heart and soul in it. And I just, I genuinely believe it can change lives, you know, and I realized I can't be half in this and half in my old business. So I actually closed my business, which yeah. was a huge like, jump for me because, you know, my business paid my mortgage, you know, um, feeds me and my children. It was a massive deal. And I've essentially wrote in a book about a magical girl and um, an evil animal named Alan. I won't say <laughs> any more than that, but it's crazy. Who does that? Who does that? But I did, and it was the best thing I ever did. And my advice to anyone else out there, you might be listening if you've got an, a vegan idea and you've got a job that you think yeah it pays the bills but I'd love to do this do you know what just go for it just do it it's the best thing I ever did and I recommend it to anyone absolutely anyone now without giving too much away let's talk more about the dark dystopian world that earthlings has set and because it, it's quite a dangerous place and it's of course one that Peridot's mother's tried to protect her from since birth can you set the scene for our listeners and tell us a little bit more about Peridot, how she came about, her name, and also more about Alan, who's a bit of an unlikely dictator. So yeah, just set the scene for us. Yeah, I'd love to. So the whole purpose of the Earthlings trilogy is to put readers in animals' paw prints. That was my idea. You know, I just thought, how, what better way to put to give people empathy for animals and for us to go through what they're going through. But I was very aware that if I wrote a book that was solely about that, only vegans are going to buy it. And vegans mm -hmm. aren't my target audience. I want the vegan community to read this book and love the characters as much as I do and champion it, um, as you guys are doing, which is amazing. It means so much to me. But, you know, my target audience is non-vegans in the hope that they pick up, you know, this fantasy novel filled with magic and adventure and epic battles and all the, the mystery and the mythology and everything that's you know, coming your way. I don't want to give away spoilers, but yes, the bears are coming. <laughs> <laughs> and the elephants. Uh, but um, yeah, and then along the chapters, hopefully, you know, the message of reverse speciesism will sink in. So uh, Peridot is magic born, but she doesn't know she's magic born. She has a very, very overprotective mother, um, who's one of like the key parts of the story. Like, there's a real kind of confusing dynamic there with the mum you know because every parent wants to protect their child for the same reason that when your child asks you it's made out of with a chicken nugget you, you don't tell them you know yeah. it's a dead chicken I do tell my children that now but you know before this journey I wouldn't have done you know every parent wants to protect their child and Peridot's mum really wants to protect her she doesn't tell her the truth of the earthlings world all of the magic and then poor Peridot on her 13th birthday um kind of stumbles across her magic because of this boy that comes over from the mainland, Ewan, who has experienced the Earthlings world, you know, hands on, face on, every body part on, poor mm -hmm. child. And, um, you know, he tries to tell her and she doesn't believe him. She thinks he's crazy, you know, because the narrative of Earthlings is a little bit out there. I'm going to lie, you know, you've really got to use your imagination here. Um, you know, but from other things that I've watched, you know, like really popular things like Marvel, Guardians of the Galaxy, everyone's favourite character is Groot, you know, the talking tree. Yeah. So if that can work, this can work, you know. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, so um, she dismisses him as crazy. And then one day he's gone and she wants him back. And um, 
her very own protective mother doesn't want her going out into the world. She doesn't want her realising, you know, this reversed society that is going on because it is the world as we know it now in reverse. Um, but, you know, she does what teenagers do and uh, she does it anyway. <laughs> but she's got magic at her disposal, but magic that she doesn't know how to control. So along her journey is, you know, this girl that's generally got the power in her hands to either save or destroy the world, discovering all the things that a vegan person will discover on their vegan journey, but in reverse, it's happening to humans, you know, it's not happening to animals, and the animals are the ones doing it to the humans. Um, and she has to decide whether to use her powers um, to help them or not, you know, which is a bit of a message that I wanted to put out there to people in general as well, because when we find out about these things, you know, animals are oppressed, they are tortured. Um, as I'm speaking now, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of animals, of fish, you know, they're being slaughtered at this very moment. Mm -hmm. What's possible ways? Do we use our voices? Do we help them? Or do we just, you know, carry on as normal? I couldn't carry on as normal, you know, and um, Earthlings is my kind of peaceful form of activism because... As it's very apparent when I do podcasts, I'm no good at speaking. Speaking is not my strong point. I, I waffle. I'm such a waffler. I, you know, cube, cube of truths and all those type of things. You know, I would love to be able to do them, but I'd be the worst person to do it because someone would ask me a question and I'd just go, what? <laughs> you know, that, that kind of activism wasn't going to work for me. And I thought, what's my strength? What am I good at doing? And I know I'm good at writing. So I pulled it into a book and um, it seems to be working, which is, yeah, yeah. I'm pinching myself. Can't believe it. It is, it is. But, you know, you say that the idea of the Earthlings world is a bit out there, but of course it's it's not. It's actually based on a lot of reality. And so with animal rights being this really strong theme throughout the book and you saying that you're using it as a form of advocacy and activism, why was it a conscious decision to market the trilogy as climate fiction rather than specifically vegan? I'm so glad you asked me this because by doing this, the people that I want to read the book the most, who aren't my target audience, who I want to read the book, are fellow vegans. And a lot of vegans aren't even aware that the book exists because it isn't marketed as vegan, vegan fiction. It is now because the cat's kind of out of the bag. I've got readers, I've got a base and it's OK. You know, the message is out there. But for the launch, if I marketed this as vegan fiction, only vegans would read it. Mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't be changing any lives, you know, because I want old me. I want Ray from 10 years ago to pick up this book not having discovered the things that I've discovered now and discover it through reading this book, you know, and I chose young adult fantasy because I love young adult fantasy. That's what I read. It's what yeah. I watch, yeah. you know, the witches series on Netflix, Harry Potter, Hunger Games. Um, I took a huge jump the other day, actually, and I felt like so stupid doing it, but I thought, you know what, let's go big or go home. I actually tweeted the director of the witcher games, um, just like the book and sent, um, and sent them like the press release for Dominion and all the rest of it because I just thought, do you know what? If this was a movie, I think I could possibly veganize the world. So it's done for this, you know. So um, yeah, there's still aims in that to go there, but I want the vegan community to read this book and love it as much as I do. But yeah. I really want it to be given to people that aren't vegan and for it to hopefully give them that light bulb moment that starts their vegan journey. Right. Absolutely. And that's the thing, because when I was a kid, a lot of the kind of books being targeted at me were sort of Enid Blight and that kind of stuff. And I just never got into it. So I wasn't actually that much of a reader as a kid. And it wasn't until I found fantasy fiction that I was like, yeah, OK, now I've found this my is cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I actually read yeah. so much more now than I ever used to. And despite being in like the wrong side of my 30s I'm still reading this young adult fiction because it actually does still appeal to me and I can still very much relate to it and and so that and I think that's the thing with earthlings as well it's not we say it's young adult fantasy fiction but it can actually be read by anybody surely yeah. and there's just such a big yeah. age range of people I'm sure reading it huge I mean from feedback that I've received from like reviews and things from people my main kind of reading group seems to be women of, of my age you know women in their 30s or, or late 20s you know which is great because they're the people that are going shopping and that have families that are making the shopping decisions and that might go to pick up a pint of milk and then think oh wait a minute hang on that was I don't want to give spoilers where people read the book but something that happens in our things and just have that moment you know and from the feedback I'm receiving you know that is happening people are, are reaching out and like I say not going vegan overnight but definitely aware of things that they weren't before but because they were open to receiving them mm -hmm. you know there's so many different forms of vegan activism 
And they're all brilliant in their own way, but no one type of activism will reach every person, you know. So the street activism is fantastic. That would work on me. But my friends would keep walking. They would not stop and engage and have that conversation, you know. Um, so there's this huge almost like dip in the market activism wise that hasn't been tapered into because what are the things that have the ability to make the hugest impact on society and it's books it's music Mm -hmm. it's movies it's media you know and like just imagine that marvel movie moment only instead of iron man flying down to save you know these people that are repressed and that need help it's animals or you know like i just can't believe that hasn't been done yet i rushed writing the things because i was convinced in my head if i don't write this in a year someone else is going to Someone else has got this story. <laughs> I just thought, you know, this, how has this not been done yet? You know, I mean, I know you've got George Orwell's, um, is that Animal Farm? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Animal Farm. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I, have, I haven't read that one yet. It's on my, it's something that Earthlings gets compared to quite a bit. But from what I've heard, the, the message in that is more kind of political than, mm-hmm. than anything else. It is, um, yeah. Which, again, is a great way. Again, activism there for all different forms of things, you know. Yeah. You've got Avatar that in its own way was a great form of activism, you know, for just trees and nature, which is suffering oh, just as much as animals at the moment, you know. I just, I wish there was more books out there. I wish someone would make a blooming movie that was a blockbuster that everyone's raving about and that goes to see and doesn't realise it's vegan. Yeah, hopefully the Earthlings trilogy is going to be that, yeah. But Dominion comes out November 10th. What's next then? We've got A Land of Hope and Glory, is it, to look forward to as the third instalment. And obviously yeah. these are very recognisable names. So can you tell us a little bit about why you decided on these three names for the trilogy? Yeah, of course. So again, when I started my vegan journey, those are three of the ones that just got me. Like, my God, even just thinking about it. It took me more than 10 attempts to watch Earth Things mm. because it is brutal. There's bits in it that I had to physically forward I couldn't watch because you, you just you want to grab your telly and throw it through the window no I don't want to see this I don't want to hear this but you have to you know because we're creating this you know um and then same with Dominion that is just as absolutely horrific and then a land of hope and glory for me one of the things prior to going vegan that I was very aware of is that whenever I saw animal cruelty videos and things online I was one of those people that always skipped through them. Because in the back of my head, I thought, yeah, but that doesn't happen in England. Yeah. That doesn't happen over here. We're not like that. We've got good animal welfare. You know, I now know that's absolute beeswax and we really, really don't. You know? So um, A Land of Hope and Glory, if you want to know how food is made in England, is the one to watch. So at the end of each book in my author's note, um, I prompt my readers um, to, if they feel compelled to do so, to please check out... um, each of the documentaries and I give the link um that enables them to do so and watch it for free. So yeah. and it kind of what's the word? Um so I'm no good at talking. <laughs> so slide she hates <laughs> moments that happen within the book. So like when I do school visits and stuff, like sometimes the children will say to me, like, why are why are the animals so angry? And you know, these are children that obviously haven't watched these documentaries. Yeah. And I can't ask them to watch them. You know, that's yeah of course. You know, I wouldn't want my children to watch these. You know, but um, for adults, certainly, if they're confused about any of the things that happen in the books, once you've watched those movies, you're like, oh, wow, yeah, we really do do that every day, every single day. I mean, with your job, you know that better than most. I take my hat off to you. I, I couldn't do what you do. I think it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. And I know that you also like to practice what you preach in terms of ethical living. So what control have you had over ensuring that the books have been printed on recycled paper? And how else are you positively contributing to the environment with the sale of your books? Oh, thank you for asking me that. Um, so like you say, it's really important to kind of practice what you preach. And I can't write a story trying to make a difference in the world and make the world a better place. And I've keep trees cut down for it. You know, that would just make me the world's biggest hypocrite. So um, my trees my trees <laughs> my books <laughs> where possible are printed on recycled paper unfortunately it's not everywhere there's a real resistance within the publishing world to use recycled paper it's really really frustrating but in every avenue that it can be it is and to um el- not alleviate but you know to, to just do everything I can to make sure that the books are as eco as possible I plant a tree for every book that's sold as well um and 
um, I'll continue to do that for all my works, every single book that I ever do. And um, I'm like a member of youth society, um, author groups and stuff now pushing to try and get sustainability within the kind of publishing world because we all know that, you know, animal agriculture is a huge, huge driver of deforestation. So mm-hmm. it's publishing, you know, really bad. A lot of the stuff that we have, um, you know, it's come from virgin trees, which is, you know, how much recycling do we have in this in this world that doesn't get used and gets burned and incinerated? It's right there. Why aren't we using it? You know, there's so, with so many issues in the world, is what I find so frustrating. The solutions are there. Every man made problem has got a man made solution, and we're just not, we're not implementing it everywhere. And I just don't get that, you know. So I try where possible to raise awareness, but um, I won't lie, it's an uphill struggle. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard because you meet so much resistance, like with veganism, you know, like you just want the world to be a better place, don't you? And it's just not as easy as I, I wish exactly. I had paradox magic. I'd use it. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, even I didn't, I had no idea that a lot of our books are still published on virgin paper. I had absolutely no idea until I started actually reading the reasons why, yeah, why you were so like advocating for recycled paper and, you know, got your petition going and things like that, which is just incredible. So I really do hope that we can see a change in the industry and hopefully having people like you up and come in in it, then you can make the impact where it needs to happen. So I just want to thank you again so much for chatting to us and wish you the best of luck and Peridot. And uh, let's hope that you're both on the right path now to save the planet. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so lovely chatting with you today and I cannot express just how much I appreciate your support. You guys at Viva have been amazing, especially you, Lex. Thank you. Thank thank you. 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 You're very welcome. (laughs) Thank you. Take care and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Well, what a lovely lady. Yeah, I think she's brilliant. I've got a lot of time for Ray, so I really enjoyed that interview. She came across so well as well in it, I thought. And is it true, she asked you to be a consultant, didn't she, before she wrote the book? Yeah, so we ended up having quite a long chat with her, actually. There was me and another investigator that ended up being quite descriptive a lot of the practices that, and like a lot of the equipment as well, so practicing equipment in slaughterhouses and on animal farms, and she ended up having to make quite a few changes for the next book just to, to make it plausible and to make it as true to life as it possibly could be. Even though it's a fantasy novel, it is kind of steeped in reality. Excellent. I love that her way of coming into veganism as well wasn't just through like one route. So initially it was great to hear that, you know, she got into finding out more about it through the health side of things. And, you know, obviously it was very sad to hear about her dad, but also about the pregnancy was interesting. Mm, mm. Um, Obviously the health was great for her to get into it, but to keep her vegan was, she says quite openly around watching the documentaries as well. And Yeah, exactly. And I always enjoy listening to people's stories into veganism because it's so unique to everybody like each of us come to it from a different perspective I suppose in many ways and you always talk about having these three roots whether it be animals the health or the planet but there's actually so many more and the fact that she you know she's like a lot of people and that she's come into it from one route but has actually found herself learning more about all the other issues and problems with factory farming and farming animals in general and the the entire industry that it it is you know she she's very knowledgeable now because of it and I find that that's what a lot of vegans do we end up going on these deep dives and it's quite difficult to get out yeah once you're in it (laughs) because you just end up learning so much and start to care about other issues as well and how like reducing your intake of something is going to do one thing and then it does another and then it does something else. So, yeah, it's pretty incredible. And the way she did it as well, obviously, at the very start was she'd reduce something and then three months later she'd do the next one, three months later the next one, yeah. finally doing fish because that was her favourite. But within a year, that's it. That's all it's taken, one year, and she's fully vegan. And that's it, that works for a lot of people. It's great. It's Yeah, and I do like hearing because, obviously, you have people that go cold turkey yeah, for one of a better <laughs> word yeah. uh, where they will just stop everything and it's like vegan overnight but then you have others and I was one of them I was vegetarian for a few years before I even went vegan so I'd already kind of cut obviously the meat and the fish out and I didn't really 
again, like a lot of vegetarians, didn't really understand what the problems were with eggs and dairy. So it did take me a little bit longer. And I think I probably transitioned to veganism easier because I'd already got to that point of being a vegetarian. So I, I didn't really struggle to take the rest of the stuff. I mean, we're still talking about, you know, just under 20 years ago yeah. for me now. So it was a time when things weren't as available, but I mean, there's just no excuse anymore. No, that's <laughs> it, the knowledge that we've got now, we, I don't think we had back then. Same as you, I was vegetarian for a long time mm. and didn't, you know, from 10, no meat. But then it was quite clear what was happening and I was like, whoa, this meat, no good. But cheese, fish, eggs, all of those things were still very much, oh, you need them for the diet, mm. you need them for this. No, you don't. No. But we didn't know. And it's great that she, but yeah, once you start that fine fact finding, and that's where you've got the benefits actually, is if you do go kind of cold turkey, yeah. as you say, for want of a better expression, because you go full dive into it. Yeah. Whereas if you've been vegetarian for ages, you're like, oh, well, you know, but actually you learn a lot. Yeah. Let's talk about how she jumped from PR though into fantasy yeah. writing, because that's, um, that's a big move. Obviously she's great at writing. We get, yeah. we can see that. But to write, to close our business and to do this full time, I mean, that's ballsy. Yeah, it takes a lot of goods <laughs> to do that. And I think that's why I really enjoy talking to people about their roots into veganism as well and the way that they go about their activism or advocacy. Because who'd have thought that like writing a climate fantasy <laughs> fiction is just teachings of veganism? <laughs> that's yeah. like the hidden message, you know, when there used to be all the sort of stuff about hidden messages in records when you play them backwards. <laughs> well, like some, yeah, <laughs> subliminal messages. I feel like she's got a really, really good strategy here that it's this subliminal message that, yeah, you should go vegan. <laughs> I love that as well. I was thinking about the things we watched when we were younger and the books we read. Because obviously things like The Animals of Farthing Wood or Watership mm -hmm. Down, my good God, yeah. that's a, they're vegan messages, aren't they, yeah. if nothing else? But they're quite... But they, again, you know, through the animals, just giving, just giving voice to the animals, yeah. you know, for children, you start to think about things like traffic, mm -hmm. hitting them and killing them, and then, and then you learn about pollution, yeah. and then, and it's, it gets you thinking, and I remember those things clearly from being a little kid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I love those books, but it was like I was saying, you know, as a kid, I didn't really do a great deal of reading, because I just wasn't into the things that people my age then yeah. were reading. It just it just wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just really nice that she's kind of come to it from this fantasy mm. background, and I, I just find it so refreshing. And I wish that, you know, when I was younger, there were books like that for me, because I never felt like there was. So I just think it's absolutely brilliant. And like I've already said as well, it's not that it's... We say it's young adult, but it, it's, it's not. It's yeah, kids as it's well. It's so accessible for anybody and everybody that I think most people will just enjoy this book. Well, that's that's the interesting thing. I mean, when I was little, I was reading, so around the age of 10, 11, I was reading kids and adult books. I was reading Terry Pratchett, which is fantasy, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. But there was, I reread them now as an adult, and I'm like, okay, he's making a cultural comment or a political comment yeah. here that went over my head. But I, I enjoyed it for the wizards and the witches and the fantasy. So kids can read that and enjoy, kind of enjoy whatever your kind of scope of yeah. references. But I was also reading stuff like, she mentioned Animal Farm. I was obsessed. I loved George Orwell for Yeah, we studied that at school as well, you yeah. know. Yeah, did you? I mean, yeah. he's, he's my favourite author, I think. And I, started, I read Animal Farm when I was 10 or 11, around mm -hmm. the same time as To Kill a Mockingbird. And I was just... I became obsessed with him and Animal Farm was amazing yeah. and then I learned about communism in Russia yeah. off the back of it, like any 10 year old. <laughs> well but that's you, the thing, you, like we studied yeah. it but I don't think I really got it at the time so I think, you know, and I got the York notes on it and stuff and, <laughs> and you know, it's just, I want to go back and reread it because yeah. I probably will get it better now. <laughs> you should, I mean, you know, even my brother was like, what happened to Boxer, what happened to Boxer? I'm like, he's glue now, Ryan, and he's like eight and he would be crying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all those like fantasy books are amazing. Like yeah. Isaac Asimov and everything. There's some, it's such a good routine, and especially I think you know you like her or loathe her, J.K. Rowling. Yeah. The Harry Potter books have done so much oh, as God, well to absolutely. get kids back into things, and it was funny. I haven't actually read the books yet. I'm sorry, Ray Star, but I will. Don't worry, I will. <laughs> it's on, I will do it over Christmas. I promise. But there's a lot at the moment as well around. I love those stories about women, especially coming mm. into their powers and yeah. learning more about the environment and through like nature you know uh, the different elements and things and yeah. she's kind of piggybacked in off off that as well at the moment it's a real cultural 
shift, isn't it, into it those? Is. Yeah, so there's a little something yeah. for everybody yeah. in there. And for anybody that's interested in having a read, we do have them available on the Viva Shop. So you can go straight to vivashop.org.uk to buy one of those and it helps support Viva's work as well. And if you've enjoyed our episode today, then please don't forget to rate, review and subscribe. See you next time. See you later.